The good news according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The good news of the Lord. Dear sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Creator and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We talked last week about Jesus in the Gospel of John from chapter 13 to chapter 17 as uh, the farewell discourse of Jesus. And we talked about how Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. He's going to die. And he's trying to get them ready for his death and to understand that that isn't the end. But they're not going to understand that until later. So last week in that text, he was trying to offer them comfort, to assure them. Remember he said, in my father's house there are many mansions, many rooms. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and take you to myself, that you can abide with me in my father's mansion. We talked about that as such a word of comfort for the disciples, that Jesus would come and get them and take them into the Father's mansion. He's going to prepare a place. So that's the basis that we are, are doing uh, this text this week, because in this text, he is now introducing the Holy Spirit for the first time in John's Gospel. It's not been mentioned before, but it is now. And we say, well, why would Jesus talk about the Holy Spirit in his farewell discourse? There again, he's trying to give them hope that when he leaves, and he says this, when he leaves, he doesn't totally leave them. Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples. And this is before his arrest and trial and crucifixion and ascension. This is before. Now remember, the di disciples don't know what's coming yet. We do. We know the story from, from the back. But the disciples, looking here, don't understand what this is going to mean. So the, the comforting words of Jesus are very critical for them to understand that they will understand even more later on. So Jesus is sharing what the function is of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't preached about very often because it's just so complicated. Just don't know how to describe it. Someone described the Holy Spirit as the shy member of the Trinity. We just don't know what it is. The only time we really preach really strongly about that is on Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit... But, but John's Gospel is introducing the Holy Spirit now. What does the Holy Spirit do? What does the Holy Spirit do? And when we answer that question, it shows us what is being done in our lives, what the Holy Spirit is doing in us. Now, in verse 12 of this same chapter, before we started our reading, Jesus says, you will do even greater works than I. And how is it that we will do greater works? Because we will have the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what he's saying. It's not possible to do good works without the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that in my life. I know. Till we get on our knees and say, Lord, I can't do it, and we keep thinking we can do it on our own, on our, by ourselves, until we get on our knees and say we can't do it, then the Holy Spirit can't work. So he says, I will provide for you another advocate. When you say another advocate, that implies there's already an advocate there. And who is that? Jesus. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus takes our part. Jesus defends us. Jesus protects us. So when he says, I will give you another advocate, the Holy Spirit, 
Another advocate meaning, you've already got one, me, I'm here. And seeing what Jesus has done in his ministry is to anticipate the work of the Holy Spirit. Do you think Jesus did that miracle without the power of God? Without the power that God gave him in the Holy Spirit to heal people, to bring Lazarus back from the dead? The Holy Spirit is grounded in the encounter of people with Jesus. They don't know it yet, but they will. So the Holy Spirit, in the events and experience of the life of Jesus, in his teaching and his preaching, his miracles, is something tangible. We can see it. But we really do not know what to do with the Holy Spirit sometimes. We confess it every week. The Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity. So let us look at what the Spirit is like as Jesus describes it in this Gospel text. First of all, verse 17. It is the Spirit of truth. Look at verse 17. It is the Spirit of truth. Jesus, before and last week, reveals himself as the way, the truth, and the life. And he speaks about truth when he's standing before Pilate and being judged, he talks about the truth before Pilate. And he says, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Why? Because the truth is the same as Jesus, and Jesus is the same as truth. I am the truth. And he says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all of the truth. You see, that's what happened on Pentecost. They had been following Jesus and all this kind of stuff. But when the Holy Spirit came, they remembered everything he had done, everything he had taught, everything he had said, because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Second point, the disciples know the Spirit. Now, in John's Gospel, the word to know is to imply a relationship. They had a relationship. And so the Spirit of truth is a relationship with Jesus. The Spirit abides with you, and the Spirit will be in you. That's very clear. This dwelling, this abiding, the Spirit will be in you. And we always say in our baptism, when you're baptized, the Spirit comes in you. Now, I still say there's a good chance the Spirit was there before your baptism. Otherwise, why were you moved to be baptized at all? But we know that the Spirit is there, this dwelling place. And so when Jesus then breathes on his disciples, they inhale the Holy Spirit. The third point. With the coming of the Spirit, he says to them, I will not leave you orphaned. If you know that your parent is dying, and your parent turns to you and says, I will not leave you orphaned, what a comforting, amazing symbol that is. Jesus says, I will not leave you without a parent. Because in John's Gospel, there's so much parental talk all the time about the Father and the Son. I'm in the Father, and the Father is in the Son, and we are in each other. And there's all this parental talk in John about the relationship between Jesus and the Father. You can even go back to chapter 1 of John's Gospel when he says, All who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God. Those who have heard Jesus, believe Jesus, have the power to become children of God. And so that promise is fulfilled now. We seem to have some kind of idea that Easter is the end. All done. Resurrection from the dead, that's the end. We seem to sort of stop right there. But the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet at Easter, right? The Easter promise of presence and power of Jesus goes beyond just the empty tomb. It's more than that. I like to think in terms of the resurrection not being the end, but a new beginning. It starts, something new begins with the resurrection. We preach the resurrection as a culmination, as an end, instead of an inauguration, a new beginning, that now we have the resurrection, we have other things that are coming that we look forward to. There's more to being a child of God than being raised from the dead. 
There's more to it than just being raised from the dead. The crucifixion brings an end to the incarnation. Now that's another John thing. The incarnation, when the word became flesh and dwelt among us, Jesus became flesh, born as a baby in Bethlehem, lived with us. That's the incarnation. God's word taking on flesh for us. And at the ascension, that's the end of the incarnation. Jesus, who came from God and was incarnated and lived with us, has now gone back to God. It's the end of the incarnation. So the resurrection isn't the end. It's another beginning. For John, the ascension of Jesus to return to his Father is the certainty of abundant life. So, I think sometimes we Christians get into a resurrection rut. We think, Easter's over, all done, that's what it's all about. No, no, there's more. We just had Easter, but we're still here. So now we're getting ready for Pentecost, which is coming. The Christian life is lived beyond the empty tomb. The tomb is part of it, but the Christian life is more than just the resurrection. The resurrection is a matter of death and life here and now. It's not just Jesus was raised and we too will be raised. It's about whether we live as resurrection people in our lives every day. In John, the resurrection points beyond itself to something more the Ascension, and Pentecost, and the Church. And that gives us the abundant life. So in the Ascension of Jesus, returning to his Father, we have the certitude of the promises of God. It reminds us where Jesus came from and where Jesus went back to, the end of the Incarnation. So the Ascension takes us full circle in the Incarnation. God sent Jesus as the baby, lived with us, incarnated in flesh, walked with us, died like we die, and then was resurrected and goes back to God. Full circle. So the resurrection is a promise, but not the last word. There's another word coming. Jesus talks about preparing a place for his disciples. But he prepares a place for us also. In the Ascension, Jesus returns to the Father, but he does not leave the disciples orphaned. Imagine how comforting this was to the disciples. They don't know what's coming yet for Jesus, but imagine what a comfort it is that Jesus is leaving, he's going to die, but he's not going to leave them orphaned. He leaves them with the promise of the Holy Spirit that will be their advocate. The Spirit will reveal the truth. Peter Marty, a pastor, ELCA pastor and writer, says, We receive the Holy Spirit as a gift. It is not found, obtained, or possessed. It is a gift. So think in terms of Jesus breathing on us. And when we inhale, we receive the Holy Spirit. Amen.